to welcome John. Thank you very much, Carol. So it really is a pleasure to welcome John. Um, I'm not going to go through his entire career um, because that would use up the next hour and a half. It is an extremely distinguished career. Uh, I think it's quite unusual. So John was born in New York City. I won't tell you when, but he is younger than me. Um, and he then went to Athens to train. So that's the reverse of most talented Greeks, I think. Um, and he then went back to the US and trained at Harvard and Tufts and held positions at NIH, Johns Hopkins, and at Tufts. But he then went um, back to Greece where he chaired the Department of Hygiene and Epidemiology at the University of Yanina. And I don't, has anyone in this room been to Yanina? Excellent. You will know it is a really beautiful place. So it's in the Pindus Mountains, and nearby is the, John may correct me, or any of you, nearby is the Oracle of Dodona, which is older than the Delphic Oracle and was more reliable. Um, and I, I don't want to say much more about John. He has, uh, according to his CV, delivered um, 500 invited and honorary lectures. We're very pleased to be the 501st. Um, and uh, he's going to talk to us about an extremely important subject which is very much on our minds. The public puts a huge amount of investment uh, into science and it's clear that it is not as reproducible as we would like or as the public would expect. And John is one of the leading uh, authorities on this. Um, his article in PLOS Medicine has been accessed over 2.5 million times and is the most accessed article ever published by the Public Laboratory of Science in the US. So I'm very much looking forward to what you have to say. Now over to you, John. Thank you for this uh, very kind invitation and for this great honor to deliver this lecture today. I'll try to share some thoughts and I understand that there is also some time at the end for questions and uh, challenging some of uh, my thinking about these issues. Reproducible and useful research, I think this is what we all want and for all of us who are interested in public health and making policy decisions, it's even more imperative to have reproducible and, health and useful research. We want to see research translated, and on average it takes a very long time. It takes 25 years from a big discovery until having a highly cited clinical paper. Even then, about 40% of the time, that extremely highly cited creme de la creme paper that is changing the world is proven to be wrong or grossly exaggerated. Sometimes it takes 200 years, like in the case of nitric oxide, a few times it takes much less. For example, one of the best experiences in my life, pretty early in my career, was when I was at NIH, and we designed a series of randomized trials that led to ACTG320, where we showed that with triple therapy, we could change HIV disease from a lethal condition to something that would become a normal life that you can have normal expectancy. It only took four years from discovering and building a protease inhibitor until getting the results on a randomized trial with a hardcore mortality outcome and major significant, not only statistically, but clinically and public health benefit. How can we get more of these success stories? First of all, maybe we do have a lot of success stories. Actually, our main problem nowadays is that we're just too successful, too successful to be true. A couple of years ago, along with David Chevalarias from the Institute of Complex Systems in Paris, we text mined the entire biomedical database of PubMed. 1990 to 2015 is about 15 million articles in abstract, and we also had about 800,000 uh, full text articles that we could text mine. 96% of the papers, both abstract and or full text, that used p-values had statistically significant results. 
and the proportion has gone down from 98% to something like 95%. Clearly, we've made great progress in medicine, in health, in public health, but have we really made progress that corresponds to millions of successful discoveries? That's extremely unlikely. So how much of that research is reproducible? This is a question that not only biomedical scientists are asking, but scientists across any scientific domain are becoming more occupied with this terminology, reproducibility of results. This is another text mining exercise where we looked across all 22 major fields of science, and over the years there's a, a geometric growth in the number of mentions of reproducibility of results. There's different types of reproducibility. There's reproducibility of methods, reproducibility of results, and reproducibility of inferences. For those of you who are quantitatively oriented, I think that you understand that if you have some software, if you have some script and some data, if you put them together, you want to get the same result. So this is reproducibility of methods. And how often do we get that? Well, we, we don't really know, because most of the time we don't have the software, we don't have the script, we don't have the data, we're missing all three pieces. Even if you miss one, you cannot really recheck. Reproducibility of results means that I do another study. New participants, new observations, and I try to see what my results look like. And then reproducibility of inferences means that I ask all the people in the audience, what do you make of these two studies? Do they agree? Do they disagree? Um, is that strong enough evidence? Is that evidence strong enough to act, to make it a public policy? And clearly, for many of those decisions, we will not agree, even though maybe all of us, all of you, might be well-trained, <coughs> cognizant, uh, well-informed, but you don't reach the same decision. <coughs> Why do we face these difficulties? To some extent, they're unavoidable. They're part of the machinery of the scientific method. But to a large extent, they're also a consequence of some inefficient research practices that have been embedded across different fields. And I, I will use two stereotypes. None of them is talking about some specific scientist who is like the bad scientist that we need to avoid. You know, it could be me, uh, the, the bad scientist. Um, but there's two stereotypes that I will present, just trying to create two types of universe of scientific investigation that are very prominent in biomedicine, <coughs> in biomedicine and public health. Small data and big data. So with small data, typically you have the solo silent investigator working alone, trying to secure funding for a couple of years and get significant results to apply for another two or three years of funding. Unavoidably limited resources, unavoidably small sample size studies, cherry picking the best results, a lot of done, that done post hoc. P-value of 0 0.04999 is good enough and no registration because that would limit the degrees of freedom in exploration. No data sharing because that would give ammunition to competitors who will get the funding and you will be left alone. And no replication because you wasted two or three years to do something and now you need to get more funding. You cannot go back and see that what you have found was actually wrong and cannot be replicated. With big data, which is becoming also a common paradigm, increasingly common nowadays, the problem is that we don't have small sample size. The problem is that we have extremely overpowered studies. We have studies that no matter what you ask, you will get statistically significant results. Uh, data gets accumulated while you're sleeping. You, know, you, you, you don't do anything. You wake up, and there's millions of new observations that have been accumulated in electronic health records or registries or others while you were sleeping, while you were dreaming, you know, doing nothing. Um, you cannot stop that. It's, it's impossible to stop the accumulation of information. Still, you need to say something. You need to pick out of that vast ocean of information something that would be a narrative, that would be a story of that makes some sense. So there's still a lot of cherry picking. Actually, I would argue that on average, there's far more cherry picking in the big data world rather than in the small data world. Almost all of that will be post hoc. The inference tools for statistics are not necessarily as simple as uh, null hypothesis significance testing with a p-value of 0.0499. Um, there is idiosyncratic statistical tools, sometimes better suited, other times ill-suited. Very little consensus. You, you look at fields that use pretty similar omics platforms, and one is using Bayesian inference, 
The other is using FDR. The third one is using frequency approaches. Um, no registration, again, for most of those, other than maybe knowing of the existence of some database or some electronic health record. And in terms of data sharing, there is more data sharing. Um, it has been inbuilt in the design of these registries or data collections that they need to be shared because this is where their life comes from. You know, just data sitting there will not be usable, but if you say they will be shared with so many investigators, then you can start cranking papers. But the problem is that neither the data generator nor the data user often understands what exactly is being shared. Uh, these data tend to be very often black boxes. Uh, we don't know the exact machinery, the exact uh, accuracy, how these definitions of data collection might be operating and what exactly they mean. Reproducibility is a contentious term. If, uh, if I tell you your research is wrong, uh, probably you will not love me for that. Hmm? Uh, if I say research in general is uh, potentially wrong, uh, then immediately you think, well, it's not my research, it's someone else's research. Uh, so that's not such a big problem. But many of the recent reproducibility checks are looking unavoidably at specific studies that cannot be reproduced. Uh, so a series of studies in preclinical medicine suggests that the reproducibility of papers coming from the best teams uh, in academic centers on drug targets have reproducibility rates between 0 to 20 percent. And each time there's a new one coming up, you know, it's a specific paper done by a specific prestigious team that is being put forward as irreproducible. That, that immediately generates a lot of tension about, so my research is wrong? No, this cannot be. I mean, I, something must be wrong in the reproducibility effort rather than in the original. It could be so. There is tension even in defining sometimes what is successful, what is unsuccessful, what is uninterpretable. I mean, this is like a compromise. Sometimes people fight each other. No, you were wrong. No, I was wrong. No, he was wrong. He, she was wrong. Uh, and eventually say, well, it's uninterpretable. We'll just leave it at that and we'll go home. Um, we need to remove some of that tension. We need to remove some of that reputation pressure and just take a step back and say, well, maybe uh, I'm lucky to work in a field where 99% of the research being done is irreproducible. So if my track record is 2% correct, yeah, I'm a superstar. That's, that's wonderful. Uh, you know, I should be happy with that. I shouldn't be happy only if 100% of my research is correct. Reproducibility efforts and replication does not happen across all scientific fields. Um, it happens in some fields that have a tradition to accommodate it. And in these fields, typically, you will also see meta-analysis where someone is taking multiple studies, putting them together, and trying to see what they say. If you have multiple studies, you can compare one against the other. And if they're all the same, what do you make of that? It's all correct? It's all wrong? Who knows? It could be all wrong. It could be that all the studies have some fundamental flaw, and they all get it wrong. Or it could be that they're all correct, or, or who knows? If the results are not consistent, then you can ask, is that inconsistency compatible with some type of bias? And then try to think ahead of time, what type of inconsistency would I get if this type of bias were to operate? So this is pretty much what we did, along with uh, Dan Fanelli and Rodrigo Costas. We took uh, all meta-analysis that we could find from any scientific field, and we asked, are the inconsistencies, the heterogeneity, consistent with patterns of bias. They were. They were consistent with most of the patterns of bias that we had anticipated, but they were not equally strong in different scientific fields. So for example, small study effects, which means that you have a pattern of stronger effects in small studies and smaller effects or no effects or even inverse effects in large studies, was very prominent in the social sciences, pretty prominent in the biomedical sciences, not really so much prominent in the physical sciences. Other biases or patterns had strength that was different in an opposite uh, type of uh, hierarchy across these different fields. So some biases may affect some fields more than others. 
some fields maybe have been immunized better compared to others to fight preemptively or by correcting whatever they do some of the results after the fact and not falling prey to some of these biases. Can we transplant the best solutions, the best ideas from one field to another? Before we do that, <clears throat> I think that we need to decide on what is our goal eventually. One goal is to get reproducible results, trustworthy results, reliable results. A second component is to get useful results. You may have entirely reproducible results, entirely correct results, entirely reliable results, but they may be completely useless. And I think that increasingly we recognize that both in biomedicine and also in public health, much of the research that is being done, especially applied research, because for early blue sky discovery, you cannot really know whether it's going to be useful or not. For late applied research, most of it, unfortunately, is not useful. What makes research useful? Here's a summary of eight criteria that I came um, across synthesizing my thinking about what makes uh, research useful. First of all, you need to have a problem to solve. Uh, if there's no problem, don't create one. Currently, one of the main challenges that we face both in medicine and public health is that we are creating problems. We are creating diseases. In almost every specialty you see, changes in the definition of what disease is in ways that more people become sick. They're not sick, but they become sick. Uh, I think that I feel perfectly fine other than that cold that I had last week, and you can see the laryngitis consequences probably in my voice today. But other than that, I feel I'm okay. Well, if I start seeing medical specialists, I'm sure that I will end up with a list of about 50 diseases that need medical attention. And maybe next year it's going to be 60 diseases, and you know, Two years from now, it would be 70 and 80, and, and you know, sooner or later, I will have every possible disease or some risk about developing that disease, and therefore something that needs to be done about it. So we need to set the threshold of where is the problem and where is the problem that we are creating. Second major issue is uh, context placement. What do we already know? Do we need yet another study of this sort? Have we had enough? Maybe we've had just too many of those. We don't need another one. Third, information gain. Information gain is a physics concept. It's the change in entropy. It's the exact same equation in physics that describes the change in entropy in the system. If I do another study, will I change the entropy of the system? And some people think, well, if you get a significant result, you will. No, that's not what I mean. If you just do a study without knowing whether it's going to be significant, non-significant, positive, negative, effect in one direction, effect in another direction. Will you change what we know? And you should be prepared for entropy change based on an anticipated results and also on non-anticipated results. Most of the time, we design studies in a way that we will change the entropy only if we get a particular type of result. And that's clearly wrong because then everybody is trying to make things fit to that particular type of result. Pragmatism. Does the research reflect real life? If it deviates, does it matter? We all like that. I mean, we want to say that my research is embedded in real life, especially in public health. I mean, that, that's essential. We're talking about real people, real communities, real populations. However, if you look closely at research that is called pragmatic, most of the time, it's not pragmatic at all. Recently, we published a couple of empirical evaluations where we looked at randomized trials that had in their title, when they were published, the term pragmatic. It's a pragmatic randomized trial. And we just looked at them. Are they really pragmatic? Most of them clearly were not. But it, it sounds like a good thing to say, you know, a pragmatic randomized trial. Patient-centeredness. Have we asked the patients what is it that they care about? Have we asked people what is essential for them? I get a feeling many times that medicine is growing independent of real people, of human beings. In, in a way, medicine is starting to become an enemy of public health, an enemy of health. Maybe we need to destroy medicine to save health. We never ask people what do they care about in their lives. Maybe they don't care about the things that we can measure, about the pathobiology, the mechanistic stuff, maybe even some of the clinical outcomes that we think, we think, might be important to capture. We need to ask them. Value for money. Is the research worth the money? 
Very rarely do we ask that question. And of course, there's ambiguity about that. There's uncertainties. There's lots of things that we cannot anticipate fully that we don't really know. Yes, if we're talking about blue sky science, that's clearly the case. I would just say, give more money for research. Clearly, research is a priority. Science is the best thing that has happened to humans. We need to learn more. Yes, more and more, more funding for research, no doubt. But if you have a specific question that has a specific applied objective, then we should be able to estimate what are the chances that what we will learn will translate to value for money. Feasibility. About a third of randomized clinical trials in surgery get abandoned because of futility. And in other fields, in observational designs, probably the futility rate is even much higher than that. And finally, transparency. It's an issue of trust. Can we trust the methods? Can we trust the data? Can we trust the analysis? Are they verifiable? Are they unbiased? And trust, increasingly, we recognize, goes beyond what is really reported in four or five or six pages of a printed publication or a PDF online. There's far more that we need to be able to probe and understand whether it is reliable. If you apply these criteria, across the biomedical literature, very few papers survive with more than just a couple of the eight features being satisfied. Even if you decide to just read New England Journal of Medicine, BMJ, Lancet, uh, and uh, PLOS Medicine, and JAMA, the vast majority of papers will fail on most of these dimensions in terms of usefulness. The end product is evidence that is of very low quality and very uncertain about helping us in making decisions. A couple of years ago, we looked at close to 1,400 systematic reviews that were published by Cochrane um, over a year and a half. <clears throat> and we asked how many of those have grades assessments, which is the grades of recommendation assessment, development, and evaluation. 44% of them did. The other 56% did not. The key reason for not having grade assessments was that there's really, well, there was no evidence to appraise. There was nothing there, so what would be there to try to evaluate? Whenever a grade was used, 13% of the time, the first listed primary outcome high, had high quality of evidence. When any primary outcome was assessed, 19% of the time, the quality was high. And if you asked for high quality of the evidence, statistically significant results, and someone concluding at the end that, yes, this is an intervention that you should apply. Go ahead. Only 25 out of 1394, less than 2% of these topics had such a nice, happy ending type of situation. Now, many Cochrane reviews probably did not have that extra last step because they're not supposed to be recommendations. They're not guidelines. Actually, there's an explicit uh, urging that reviewers should not become guideline developers within the systematic review. However, if you have really good news, these are very easy to, to provide, and they're very difficult to hide otherwise. So the, the vast majority of topics, we don't have evidence that would be conclusive for action, but nevertheless, we still need to act, because these diseases are there, these problems need to be prevented or need to be treated. Patient relevance of outcomes also is questionable. Uh, this is an empirical evaluation looking at randomized trials on preterm infants. This is a field that is probably as sensitized as any other field across biomedicine about the need to get relevant evidence. Pretty much this is where the Cochrane collaboration started, systematic reviews on uh, perinatal uh, health and pregnancy. And only 30%, 32% of the randomized trials in that field used as an outcome chronic lung disease, which is like a sine qua non main outcome, clinically relevant outcome that you need to have information on before you can make any decision about what you're going to do with an intervention. Traditionally, you have seen these types of uh, pyramids. Um, we're trying to put our fragmented uh, and sequestered evidence into some order. And we say that uh, meta-analysis and systematic reviews at the top, um, randomized controlled trials next to that. Um, then you have desert all around the pyramid. You have lots of expert opinion. 
Uh, there's new waves of desert nowadays with lots of tweets uh, from experts and not so experts necessarily uh, running the world. And um, then you very often realize that these pyramids are less than optimal. They're destroyed like this one. And uh, eventually you end up with a situation that you need to survive with what I call MMM, not M&M. Um, it's the, the medical misinformation mess. Much published research is not reliable, of uncertain reliability, or offers no benefit, is not useful for decision making. Most healthcare professionals are not aware of how serious this problem is. Even if they are aware of the problem, most of them lack the skills that are necessary to evaluate the reliability and the usefulness of medical evidence. And sometimes you cannot even ask them to evaluate the reliability because lots of the machinery is hidden from what is being disseminated in public view. And finally, you have patients, families, communities that lack the relevant accurate medical evidence and skill guidance at the time of medical decision making. Sometimes the destruction or the subversion of the evidence has a clear culprit. Sometimes it's clear financial conflicts of interest that someone wanted to make money, so they bulldoze the pyramid. Uh, and sometimes you may become paranoid thinking that, oh, where is the money here? And just start thinking about conspiracy theories of why is that study distorted and why did they get this result? It's not easy. We have improved our transparency for some types of financial conflicts, but there are financial conflicts everywhere, <clears throat> and it would be wrong to just say that everything is just financial conflict related. There's other conflicts sometimes that could be very strong. There's just beliefs. There's, I have very strong beliefs. I'm sure that I'm biased all the time in whatever statement I make, and, and I'm happy to have people remind me about that. So how are we going to survive the medical misinformation mess? We need to think about what our tools can do. And over the years, some tools of appraisal of evidence have become more popular, more widely disseminated, but also subverted, more widely subverted. A couple of years ago, I wrote that paper uh, in memory uh, to David Sackett, my late mentor, and I argued that evidence-based medicine has become very, very successful, but it has also been hijacked at the same time by vested interests who are using the very same tools for a very different type of agenda. Here's uh, one example. Industry trials have become extremely well done. If you look at their quality scores, they score extremely well. On average, they score better than academic-led trials in most fields. And like in this case, 96.5% of the time, they get favorable results for the sponsor. These are head-to-head -head large non-inferiority trials that were sponsored by a particular company. One drug sponsored versus another one. The conclusion was favorable for the sponsor 96.5% of the time. These trials look fabulous. They look very well done. They score very highly on quality scales. And I would argue if the success rate is 96.5%, why do we run these trials? We can skip that step. You know, we just say the trial is going to be successful and we'll save some money. What is wrong here? The, the trial, as I said, is perfect. But you, if you look more carefully, the trial has been designed in a way, very carefully and very thoughtfully so, that it will always, 96.5%, get a favorable result. For example, the non inferiority margin and the selection of the outcome is such that you're doomed to get a favorable result. Can meta-analysis save the day? I have been a very strong supporter of meta-analysis in various forms over 25 plus years now, and I'm happy to see that they have become so widely established and they have reached and stayed at the top of the pyramid. However, I have to realize that most of the meta-analysis are just useless or flawed or both. And this is a, an empirical evaluation that I published two years ago looking at the MetaPi. There's about 100,000 meta-analyses that have been done out there, about a quarter of system, a quarter million systematic reviews. About 20% of them remain unpublished. A, a large section of them are redundant and unnecessary. 
Uh, many are decent, but not really useful. Uh, there's tons of misleading abandoned genetics. There's thousands of meta-nails from China looking at candida genes that we know, you know should have been abandoned long ago. Um, many of those are flawed beyond repair. I have an embarrassment of riches using flawed meta-analysis for my courses with my students, and they find more and more that they bring to me every day. And there's about 3% that are both decent and clinically useful. How do we separate that 3%? How do we make that a bigger proportion of that top of the pyramid, of that extremely influential design? <coughs> and then there's another frontier, um, maybe the last frontier of defense, which is guidelines, which use primary evidence and meta-analysis and synthesis of that through careful judgment. And unfortunately, that last frontier is also broken. A few years ago, along with Ginny Lenzer and other colleagues, we published that paper in the BMJ, where we estimated that about 85% of guidelines have one or more red flags that eventually make them a potential threat to patients and health. So for example, Sponsors is a professional society that receives substantial industry funding. The sponsor is a proprietary company or is undeclared or hidden. A committee chair has very strong financial conflicts. Multiple panel members have strong financial conflicts. Stacking, no conflict at all. You know, all people are entirely independent of conflicts. But we know very well that they have expressed their opinion, that they believe that this drug or this intervention should be used. So you, know, you cherry pick those, and you, you put these scents together, and, and, and you have you know, the, the, the most unbiased but most biased stacked committee possible to get a particular result. So uh, multiple, multiple other possibilities that could uh, get things astray. Um, last month, I published that paper, and I I picked a circulation journal because I, I wanted to annoy people as much as possible. Uh, and uh, uh, the title is what you see. Professional society should ab abstain from authorship of guidelines and disease definition statements. Uh, practically, what I argued is that these papers are, are really organizing ignorance and uh, in a bad way. Uh, with major consequences, probably very adverse ones, for medicine and public health. They're extremely influential. Eight of the 15 most cited papers across medicine in 2016 are guidelines uh, across all medicine. Uh, and actually, these are cardiology guidelines. But you have some other specialties like oncology and gastroenterology coming very close to, to the very top. Um, there are journals like European Heart Journal, where 19 of the 20 most cited papers in the last decade are guidelines. And one is a disease definition uh, statement. And that has caused a tenfold increase in the impact factor. And these journals and these guidelines are run by societies like the American Heart Association that gets more than 200,000 million from the industry per year, or the European Society of Cardiology that gets 77% of its income directly from the industry. I would argue that other 23% is also from the industry because it's all these big meetings that people go because they think they have to go. And again, there are meetings that the industry is pretty much spearheading to, uh, to get them going. So <clears throat> are there solutions to these challenges? There's many solutions. And I don't want to give a desperate picture that, uh, well, we have nothing to do. Science has grown over centuries, and the scientific method has been applied in better ways with more protection from bias in some fields when scientists have realized that in order to make their research more efficient and better and more reliable, they need to take some extra steps, sometimes maybe take less steps and do it with less money and less resources compared to more complex structures that would lead them astray. There's many other speculative solutions, and we need to think very carefully about uh, what if I make a suggestion that is not evidence-based, that has no support, but sounds uh, interesting. Does it mean that it would work? We need to test some of these solutions that have not been tested before. This is a summary of 12 families of research practices where things could get better. Large-scale collaborative research, adoption of replication culture, registration of studies, protocols, analysis codes, data sets, raw data, and results, sharing of anything, data, uh, protocols, uh, materials, uh, software, other tools, reproducibility checks, 
containment of conflicted sponsors and authors, more appropriate statistical methods, standardization of definitions and analysis, more stringent thresholds for claiming discoveries or successes, improvement of study design standards, improvements in peer review in reporting and dissemination of research, and better training of the scientific workforce in methods and statistical literacy. Here's one example. Human genome epidemiology has used the replication and collaboration large-scale paradigm as a sine qua non. Uh, before we started running these large consortia with tens and hundreds of uh, teams of investigators joining forces in a single analysis with standardized statistics with the whole genome being analyzed in the same way with two or three teams of analysts cross-checking the analysis and the results, uh, we thought that we had found 359 genes that regulate smoking behavior. Once we did that and we put the data together, we realized that all of the 359 signals were wrong, and we started discovering some new ones, and now, you know, slowly we're getting back up to, I don't think we're up to 359 yet, but hopefully we will get there one, one day soon. Registration. Registration can also make uh, quite a difference. There's different levels of registration, and not all research can be registered. Uh, there's a lot of exploration, and exploration is perfectly fine. I do a lot of exploratory research, and I'm sure that much of that is wrong, but this is wonderful. You know, it's, it's wonderful to try different things without a specific plan, because we don't know exactly what should be the best plan. The only caveat is that this type of research should be declared as such. It should be conveyed that that was exploration, and therefore here's what has been found, and could someone now try to reproduce that, validate it, confirm it in a way that has been pre-registered in a prospective uh, validation or confirmation. Level one is registration of a data set. Uh, it's good to know about an existence of a data set in the same way as it's good to know about the existence of a nuclear arsenal. You, know, you, you, you convey the sense that I have uh, information on 5,000 variables on 1 million participants, and tonight I can press a button and send uh, 5 trillion p-values against you. Hmm? It's, uh, it, it's one way to inform about uh, what is the space of potential analysis that could be done, especially in an observational framework. Level two is registration of a protocol, if a protocol exists. Level three would be registration of an analysis plan, and this is different from a protocol. I've seen many studies that have 200 pages worth of protocol but no analysis plan. And some people might argue that th there's a lot of uncertainties about what might happen during the conduct of a real study, especially a study with humans, a study with communities, public health. People may act in, in weird ways. I would argue that it still makes sense to separate what parts of the analysis were anticipated and what parts of the analysis were kind of adapted or, or in reply to some of the occurrences that emerged during the conduct of the study. Level four adds an extra layer of trust because you don't only give the protocol and the raw data and, and the analysis, but also the raw data. And level five is open live streaming that has been used in some fields like systems biology. If you don't have registration, which is what the vast majority of observational research is about, in several situations, not all, but in several situations, almost any result can be obtained. And I call that phenomenon the vibration of effects, because you don't have a single effect that represents, let's say, an association or a correlation analysis. You have a range of possible effects that could emerge depending on how exactly the analysis is going to be done in the very same data set for the very same question. In its extreme, this becomes what I call the Janus phenomenon, Janus being that Greek Roman god who could see in two opposite directions. In some fields, the propensity for vibration of effects and the Janus phenomenon is extreme. Nutritional epidemiology, for example, we have seen empirically, is extremely prone to the Janus phenomenon. And this is one such example from the National Household Survey. If you look at the right panels, um, you have the hazard ratio on the horizontal axis, and you have the minus log 10 uh, p-value on the vertical axis. There's one million data points shown, and these are all analysis of the very same data with one million different ways to analyze them. How do you get one million different ways? Practically, there's analysis here about uh, uh, whether alpha tocopherol levels are associated with the risk of death. So it's, uh, it's a very 
simple model, but you need to adjust for other things that are related to the risk of death, like age or gender or history of heart attack or history of cancer or exercise or smoking and so forth. If you decide to include the variable in the model or not include it, you have two options. If you have 20 variables and you easily have more than 20, 2 to the 20 is 1 million different ways to analyze the data. If you run that 1 million analysis, 70% of those, 700,000 analysis suggest that tocopherol um, decreases the risk of death. 30%, 300,000 analysis suggests that alpha tocopherol increases the risk of death. Unless you have pre-specified how the analysis is going to be run, you can get any result that you want and you can publish any result that you believe ahead of time. This is probably what you get when you get these tens of thousands of papers of nutritional epidemiology hitting the news and being published in top journals and getting maximal attention in public media. Uh, this is actually a paper that was one of the 20 most visible papers across all science in the last two years. The conclusion was that with three cups of coffee per day, your risk of death decreases by 17%. And I think that I missed my coffee this afternoon, so I'm already lagging behind 6%. Did I have it in the morning? Probably not. I'm lagging behind 12% roughly in my death risk just today. Um, so is, is, that, is that credible? In a setting of lack of pre-registration, I think you have to say, well, maybe it is, but then you start to s compare nodes with other results, and you see that not only coffee, but also any nutrient and any food has this type of results. And then you realize that that's not really possible because even if these nutrients are correlated, it's impossible, it's implausible to have hundreds of different nutritional variables, each one of them decreasing your risk of death by 17%. You, know, you would easily live uh, something like uh, 5,000 years otherwise. So I'm not trying to say that observational epidemiology is not useful for policy decisions. Actually, many policy decisions, perhaps most policy decisions, would need to be made with observational epidemiology. But why is it that I believe that air pollution epidemiology is extremely trustworthy, while coffee epidemiology is not trustworthy at all? Number one is the effect sizes. If you look at the nutritional epidemiology track record and you, you try to make sense of all these benefits or, or harms, very quickly you realize that they're incompatible with common sense. You, they cannot really coexist. It could be that one or two or three out of these hundreds of nutrients may really do the trick, but I don't know exactly which ones they are. Second is the availability of raw data, which for air pollution epidemiology, the pivotal studies have shared their data, while almost nothing of that sort has happened in nutritional epidemiology. Third is the availability of protocols that have been vetted and widely shared. Fourth is the reanalysis of the raw data that shows consistent results from independent analysts. And five is the reanalysis by contrarian teams who didn't really believe that air pollution would be such a big threat to death and to cardiovascular and other morbidity. And they still reanalyzed the same data and they got the same conclusion. This has not happened in most, if not all, of nutritional epidemiology. So, with the very same type of constraints, you can have a set of research practices that can take one type of, of, uh, of research process that is not perfect, but can still be very useful to lead you to some credible and reliable decision making. Raw data is not the end of the story. I think that raw data can still be horribly biased if selected by investigators who have predetermined what they want to conclude. Here's one example. This is a, a meta-analysis by the Global Consortium on BMI and Mortality. The list of investigators is superstars, is the best in the world. The analytical machinery is led by Cambridge, and there's no better scientist in the world to do that. So it's, it's like the perfect analysis. What is wrong is that the raw data that have been included include only about a third of the available published raw data. Visibly, the ones that are not included reach entirely different conclusions to the ones that are included. Like the global consortium has 10,000 participants, and of those, about 4 million are analyzed. But there's a large study of 12 million participants that shows exactly the opposite odds ratio in terms of mortality in the overweight group. 
the used analysis eventually use about a tenth of the overall evidence. And the only way to get this type of odds ratio is to select this subset of a subset to arrive to something that you would know would be the result even before reanalyzing the raw data and even before getting the best analyst team in the world to reanalyze them. In some cases, we have a frontier battle between tools like randomized trials and tools like routinely collected data. And the tension is if we have questions where it's not impossible to randomize but difficult to randomize, should we still randomize? In that borderland, there is a lot of friction, and I, I see that every day. I have to say that personally, I have not concluded about what is best. It would be wonderful if we can use observational data, including routinely collected data, to try to answer some questions that would take a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of resources to answer with randomized trials. But I'm not really sure that the results would be compatible with what we would get with randomized trials. With randomized trials, again, not being the perfect gold standard, but it could be something like a silver or bronze standard. So here's what we did here. We took uh, situations where there was no randomized trial ever done, but there was a study based on routinely collected data, and someone found that one or another treatment in a comparison seemed to be better. And then subsequent to that, there was a randomized trial performed on that very same comparison. So we compare the results before and after. We see a difference for mortality outcomes of 31% on a NODS ratio scale. Now, effective treatments for death, I would be very, very happy with a 5% change in the odds ratio. You know, the, 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 you know, most effective treatments do not accomplish more than that. So if, if the noise, if the deviation is six times bigger than the effect, I would feel very uncertain and very problematic about using these data to make sound decisions. Of course, you can challenge these results, and you know, many colleagues who felt that, uh, no, uh, you, you, you set the comparison in such a way that would be biased and um, you know, would lead to a kind of a regression to the mean phenomenon, which, which I recognize from the very beginning, but this is exactly the way that the decision is going to be made. Even if you reanalyze them, trying to exclude that component, you get, get still a deviation of more than 30%, which seems that the noise is much bigger than the signal. Eventually, uh, what we care about is transparency. Can we trust the data? If you read a paper, it's an advertisement. It's a few pages that is telling you that research has been done. Trust me. But has this research been done in a way that it is described in the paper? This is uh, study 329. It sounds like a submarine. It's not U329. It's a study by Smith, Klein, Beecham, published in 2001, and showing that paroxetine and amipramine, two antidepressants, are very effective treatment for major depression in adolescents. Fifteen years later, independent investigators look at the very same data and they conclude that actually both imipramine and paroxetine are not effective and they're not safe. What should I believe? How commonly do we see that? A few years ago, we looked at all the published reanalysis of randomized trials. We found 37 of them and 35% of the time, the conclusion was pretty much the same as in the U or 329 story. Initial analysis suggests the treatment is effective, reanalysis suggests it's not effective, or different conclusion in terms of who are the patients to be treated. Who did these reanalysis? One might think that these were opportunistic rogue analysts, data parasites, as my good friend uh, Jeff Drazen would say, uh, and you know, they wanted to put these great clinical researchers to shame. In fact, the reanalysis were done by the very same investigators who published the original papers but they just reached a different conclusion. And, and how come? Well, if you reanalyze the same data on the same pickle, on the same question, and you get exactly the same conclusion, will you be able to publish? They will say, you publish your results. Now, if you say, now I have found something completely different, something new, novel, innovative, insightful, that makes a story. You know, it, it will be publishable. It will be very confusing, but it will be publishable. So probably what we're seeing is just the result of the incentive structure in terms of what replication, what reanalysis is acceptable. Is there a different environment? Yes, 
in the last three years, PLOS Medicine and BMJ have <coughs> accepted that you're not going to be able to publish a randomized trial unless you pledge that the full road data and the protocol of your study will become available to anyone who asks for them. So all the trialists who published in the last three years in PLOS Medicine and BMJ got an email from me and from Florian Odet uh, saying that we want to reanalyze your data. You know, you can imagine how happy someone would be getting an email from me that I want to reanalyze their data. Um, yet, even for me, they did send the data 46% of the time. And we did reanalyze all of these trials and we found several small errors, but in no case did we find a situation where the conclusion was different. So you have here an opposite extreme of full transparency, of pledged transparency, of the champion journals and of the champion investigators who are willing to share everything and then everything seems reproducible. The truth is probably somewhere in the middle. And I think that the more we move towards transparency, hopefully we will move more towards the latter example. Sharing is not easy to do. It takes time, it takes resources, it takes effort, it takes pre-planning. It will not be done easily if we ask each one of us to kind of share all their data and prepare the infrastructure and build the infrastructure from scratch. We need to have mechanisms in place and these are better developed if they're centralized, if funding agencies, if societies, if journals, if institutions have mechanisms in place and infrastructure in place to allow for the sharing to take place. Is that becoming more common? It does. A few years ago, we looked at a random sample of the biomedical literature from 2000 to 2014, and in that random sample, hardly any data sharing was happening. We repeated that same random sample from 2015 to 2017. The paper will be coming out in PLOS Biology in uh, two weeks or less, actually, yeah, nine days, and we found that 20% of a random sample of the recent biomedical literature is sharing the raw data. So it's still less than half full, but I think that we still have some motion, we still see some improvement and some traction in the field. Reproducibility of computational methods is also a vast frontier that we can see vast improvements. A couple of years ago we published these recommendations in science where we realized that most journals and most fields have very poor reproducibility of computational approaches, but there's clear exceptions. So therefore, we set levels that would be goals for different journals and different fields to aim for. The lowest, journal, the lowest goal would be if there is a link somewhere saying that the raw data and the script is here, someone should click on it and make sure that it opens, because very often you click and you get an error sign. Uh, there's multiple higher levels all the way to spending five years of your life trying to reanalyze a data set, saying that it is not reanalyzable. You get a completely different result. The original publications seem to be entirely wrong. You scream, you write, you send your paper everywhere to nature. They tell you these are not novel findings. You publish it in the Annals of Statistics or some journal that is very prestigious for five people who read it. And then it was realized that the original investigator was a fraud in his CV and he had claimed to be a Rhodes Scholar and he was not. And then people started looking very carefully and they recognized that yes, indeed, that in entire literature that had led also to randomized clinical trials being done was just completely wrong. This is the experience of Keith Baggerly from MD Anderson who became a, a forensic uh, bioinformatician uh, without recognizing what he was becoming over five years that he was trying to reanalyze these data. Better statistics and methods can also go a long way. Um, transparent and registered statistical analysis plans, when they're feasible, could be helpful. Statistical training and improved literacy and numeracy of the scientific workforce. Better study design, standard features like randomization and blinding of investigators in animal experiments. They use only 5% of the time for blinding and 30% of the time for randomization. They cost nothing. They could have saved us lots of trouble, but they, they're not used. A particularly hot and contentious issue is whether we should change our statistical inference tools. And uh, about a year ago, I wrote that paper with another 71 people where we asked for adding an extra zero to that p-value for claiming significance at 0.005 instead of 0.05. And I'm, I'm the first to acknowledge that it is a suboptimal measure. It's a temporizing measure. It's, it's an effort 
to build a dam against a flood of statistical significance. Everything is statistical significant. If you add that extra zero, immediately about 40% of the literature suddenly is no longer significant. Hmm? It's not that bad. Some of that suddenly non-significant literature will be truly significant and even useful perhaps, a little bit of that. But that's going to be a very, very small number and proportion compared to the vast majority that will suddenly become just suggestive. But the truth is that our statistical tools are not well suited for what we want to study. For example, we all use, or most of us use, null hypothesis significance testing, but it is not a good choice for developing a diagnostic score. It is not a good choice for developing and assessing a diagnostic test. It is not a good choice for evaluating a therapy. It is not a good choice for mining electronic health records. It is not a good choice for mining big data. It's not a good choice for almost anything. About 90% of the literature would do much better using different inference tools rather than null hypothesis significance testing. It's about 10 to 20% that would still be perfectly appropriate and the best choice. How do we train? 20 million people who are the co-authors of scientific papers to use proper statistics. We need to rethink about our entire curriculum, what we prioritize, where we pay more attention, what do we want scientists to be cognizant in, not necessarily minute details of the subject matter, but very intensively trained in data science. Other challenges, how do we contain the influence of conflicted stakeholders and authors? Maybe we need to think radically is transparency in potential conflicts of interest enough? If you see the conflicts of interest and you click, conflicts of interest are to be found in that link, and you open the link and you see that here's a scientist who has five pages of conflicts of interest, and you know, he has worked with 524 different companies, uh, very well balanced apparently, is that enough to know about it? Should we change our thinking about who should be allowed to be sponsors and authors of randomized trials, of meta-analysis, of cost-effectiveness analysis, of guidelines, or other sensitive studies? Should they move to the public sphere rather than to the private sphere and to conflict sphere? We learn about conflicts of interest usually when things go to court. We realize that companies are doing their best. They're just trying to sell more of their product. I, I'm not going to complain about that. That's what I would do if that were my product. However, how do we make sure that we avoid as much of that conflict world as possible? At the end of the day, we need to make decisions. And decisions need to be made with suboptimal evidence, with conflicted evidence, with biased evidence, with flawed evidence, with useless evidence. We still need to make decisions. And we will have to make decisions no matter what. I'm not saying not to make decisions. But I think that it is important to make sure that whenever we make decisions, we can separate that these are decisions where we have very strong evidence, like climate change or smoking, versus these are decisions that we're making, but we're very, very uncertain. Like, you know, here's probably the best diet for you. I'm not really sure, but let's try it. We also need to evaluate what we know about our research practices and what we do not know about research practices. So meta-research, that field that I have been trying to, to build in the last several years, is exactly about evaluating and improvement research methods and practices. How to perform research, how to communicate research, how to verify research, how to evaluate research, eventually how to reward research. And I will close with a few slides on rewarding research. Because no matter what we do, unless we reward and incentivize the best practices is unlikely that we will get anywhere. Meta Research Innovation Center at Stanford is such an effort to try to improve research practices and their reward systems. If you look at science, it's a big universe. It's very difficult to do a randomized trial with that entire universe being affected. You can try to model that universe, though. And this is uh, one such example where, along with uh, uh, David Grimes, we created a system of 11 equations to describe a universe of science with different reward systems. And we argued that most scientists are diligent. There are some of us who might be careless at times. And there's a very small proportion, about 1% or less, who are unethical, you know, frauds, creating data that don't really exist, and so forth. We run the system through funding cycles, and we realize that 
in the default situation, the careless and the unethical cohort will take over after a number of cycles and the proportion of diligent scientists will decrease if they're all rewarded the same for getting to the Eureka discovery success conclusion. You don't need 11 equations to understand that. If I can get somewhere and get promoted, get funding, get tenured, get whatever, get famed by cutting corners and someone else needs to get there by doing the right thing and doing the right job, the one who cuts corner will get there first. So we need to think about how we incentivize not just producing more research, which we're doing extremely well, and we get these millions of papers with 96% of them having significant results. I have nothing against productivity. I am addicted. I write like crazy morning and day and, and night uh, and publish like crazy. But how do we incentivize other dimensions? How do we incentivize quality, reproducibility, sharing, and translational impact for those researchers who are at the applied side of the translational spectrum? There are ways that these can be measured. There's ways that these can be appraised. There's ways that we can give a message that that really matters, that we do care about. And for people who are in public health, clearly that should be a priority. Changing the world meaningfully in terms of translational impact and in ways that are trustworthy and transparent. There's many steps in the application of scientific method that things can go wrong, many steps that we can get them right. There's also different stakeholders there's stakeholders who want to publish, there's stakeholders who want to get funding, there's stakeholders who want to see things translated, there's stakeholders who want to make profit. There's nothing wrong with any of that provided that we can synchronize and make sure that eventually we get useful, translated, potentially translated research. To conclude, the reproducibility and usefulness of many disciplines of medical and public health research has substantial room for improvement. There are many possible interventions that may improve the efficiency of research practices and the reproducibility and utility of the evidence. Transparency, openness, and sharing is likely to help, but details on how to can be important, and I think that they need to be studied. We need empirical meta-research on that. Decisions for policy should not be paralyzed because evidence is suboptimal. It has always been suboptimal in most situations, but we should acknowledge how suboptimal it is and try to fix it whenever possible.